The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Philosophy, Debates, and Humanism with Professor A.C. Grayling. Professor A.C. Grayling obtained a doctorate in philosophy in 1981 from Magdalen College, Oxford. He's the author of more than 30 books on philosophical topics. He is the founder and master of New College of the Humanities in London, and he's the vice president of the British Humanist Association. We both spoke at the QED conference in Manchester, England, and he was gracious enough to sit down for this discussion. And I love philosophy, and you know, if I if I win the lottery, I'll be moving here and, and applying for your university. Oh, you you'll be a shoe. Some, but um, you spoke about different forms of skepticism, and I noticed that you'd written uh, a book on Descartes, who I once uh, incorrectly criticized out of my own ignorance as having gotten exactly one thing right and everything else wrong, mm -hmm. primarily because of his religious leanings, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, I, what was that? The, was it Hobbes who pointed out another problem in um, Descartes' first meditation that it assumes the primacy of reason? reason yeah. But have you? You haven't written anything on Hume, and I have a little actually. There's a, a chapter on Hume in a in a book I edited. Mm. Um, so it's just a description of his uh, of his view. Um, but uh, it's interesting you should raise uh, his name in the connection of. Of skepticism because people think that he's a skeptic when in fact of course he isn't I mean the, the answer to the uh, problem that he poses in the treatise of human nature um, the problem about how we can be sure there's an external world how we can rely on inductive inferences how we can uh, think of the of the world as a causal realm when we can't see that thing which is the necessary connection between the cause and its effect uh, even um, whether or not there is such a thing as the self which endures through time he seems to be skeptical about all these things because his argument is that there's no empirical basis for uh, believing in them but then of course he says these uh, commitments that we have to the existence of the external world the reliability of induction and causation and so on are built into the way that we experience. They're part of the cognitive architecture uh, of our mm -hmm. um, minds. Um, that is why his book is called A Treatise of Human Nature, because it is human nature that provides us with certainty and not rationalistic kinds of proofs. And that was the great trigger for Immanuel Kant, who in the Critique of Pure Reason took this idea of Hume's, this intuition, and made a, a very powerful, elaborate um, structure of argument out of, out of it. And I've always been as, as a self-explorer of it. When I, when I read Hume, and in many ways, and I, I probably have the same misperception that other people have, I, it kind of settled epistemology for me a little bit to where I didn't feel like I needed to read every philosopher ever. And why would I toil around with all these different thoughts? I can at least start here and move on from there. Sure. Um, it's, it's a field that you've done lots of thinking and writing about. Um, do we have a pretty settled view of epistemology at all? Well, one thing that um, you can regard as progress in epistemology is that that great tradition, beginning with Descartes and including Hume, and coming all the way up to, to Russell himself and, and uh, A.J. Eyre, who was a teacher of mine at, at Oxford, they all shared the same starting point, which was from the private data of conscious experience, we have to try to build a, a bridge out to something which isn't ourselves, to a world external to us. And um, I was just mentioning there in the talk that that was unsuccessful in Descartes' case. He had to help himself to a notion of a good God whose goodness is the guarantee that mm -hmm. our experience tells us about a world because a good God wouldn't want to fool us um, about what our experience represents. But all his successes in the philosophical tradition thought that that was just too, you know, ad hoc. So we'd have to find some other way. And Locke and Berkeley and Hume and, and Mill and all the way up, and Kant, of course, and Mill and all the way up to Russell and Eyre, they all tried. How do you navigate a, a completely secure epistemological route from private conscious experience to an external world? And they all failed. And that is why in the 20th century, you see in their very different ways um, Wittgenstein and uh, John Dewey in, in the States and Heidegger, all of them saying, no, you don't start with the private data of consciousness, you've got to start in the public domain and work back inwards instead of starting inwards and working outwards. 
And this is a whole different perspective on uh, the idea of, of um, knowledge. John Dewey has this very interesting idea that the beginnings of our thought about how we have experience is what he called the participant perspective. We are participators in a pre-existing uh, reality which we wake up in, we find ourselves dealing with an outside world before we begin to reflect on, on the inner. And if we can try to make an argument out of that, it's still quite hard to do. But insofar as, as we've recognized that we need a change of, of perspective on this question, that is progress. So th th there is a, there's a lot of toil, and, and it continues today. I, I debated a presuppositionalist uh, over this concept of absolute certainty, that uh, the, the ancient uh, skeptics kind of, in my view, injected this idea that we can't get to absolute certainty and without it we're stuck. In, in modern philosophy, we would, I guess we would argue that knowledge isn't dependent on absolute certainty, that there's a, a more rationalist view, obviously there's competing views. Do we, are we done now with the idea of absolute certainty? Have we, have we kind of put it to bed? And well, something has taken its place, actually, and um, the, the most interesting uh, way into explaining this is to look at what uh, Russell said in his last serious philosophical work, which is a big book called Human Knowledge, Its Scope and Limits. Now, after he finished doing the work on the Principia Mathematica in about 1911 or so, Russell turned his attention to the philosophical problem of how science can be based ultimately on sense experience, on, on an empirical basis. And he tried again and again and again to construct a, a different basis for, for epistemology, mm -hmm. always an empirical epistemology, always trying to get this structure which goes from observation to theory. Uh, and um, finally, after the Second World War, he wrote this book, Human Knowledge, and in it he said, unless we know something a priori, unless we know something independently of experience, science is moonshine. But science is not moonshine, therefore we do know something a priori. Now, despite his great contempt for, for Kant, whom he regarded as having effected what he called a Ptolemaic counter-revolution <laughs> in favour of the human mind, you know, putting the human mind back at the centre of the universe, and despite that, this point that he arrived at is very similar to, to Kant's point. And the way you can gloss it is this, that we've given up on the idea of, of certainty in favor of a much more sophisticated idea, which is the idea of undischargeable assumptions. That there are certain things that we have to assume, that we cannot not assume, because there is no way that we can construct any kind of edifice of knowledge or thought unless we make those assumptions. And the assumptions in question would be precisely the ones that Hume mentioned, that the world is a causal realm, that the future will more or less resemble the past, that we have an enduring self, uh, and so on. And this is, this is thank you, because this is incredibly enlightening for me. When I debated Saiten Bergenkate and on this subject, there had been a lot of conversations, and I knew what he was going to say. He, he, he's a presuppositionalist, but he doesn't, he, he's a parrot. He, he relays the thoughts of others as well. And I knew that, that certainty was going to come up. And so I sat down and thought about how best to explain this. And what I came up with was an idea, uh, which evidently mirrors Russell's, which I wasn't familiar with, of maximal certainty. Instead of saying absolute certainty, you have uh, the logical absolutes, the primacy of existence. And from those, we derive things deductively to what would be maximal certainty, mathematics, things like that, so that we're not stuck questioning everything. Um, so I will go read more Russell. Um, I mean, uh, so something to add to this is that uh, if we think about the, the, the levels of, of um, security that we feel about uh, our views of the world on which we base our actions and our further inferences, then if you had um, a, an argument or an experience which gave you absolute certainty, you were coerced by it, you couldn't think otherwise, uh, so it's sort of knocked down. That that's how things are. And it's true. Then of course you've got something which um, you can you can stick stick with and hold fast. But most of our experience and most of the discussions and arguments that we have with one another can at most achieve something less than that, something weaker, which is persuasiveness. So a lot of debate, for example, in philosophy, and certainly almost all the work is done in science, is persuasive rather than coercive, right. because. Uh, we leave open the fact that we might be shown by future experiment or future evidence that we need to adjust or, or even give up that way of thinking. We, we have scientific tentative positions and exactly. understanding of the universe. But a persuasive argument is still one that you can, you, know, you can really premise and you can rely on and it would be quite a firm base to go forward on. 
because weaker than that is an inclining argument or inclining evidence. So it inclines us to think, well, that's how things might be. And since I'm inclined to think that, and since the ethics of rationality require of me you know, that I act or that, or that I, I premise this, um, you can take an inclining argument seriously. It might be that an argument or evidence is neutral, that it doesn't settle matters either way, and so it's still an open question. Sometimes evidence and argument is negative. That is, it tells you that the other side of the story is more likely right because the argument is so bad or the evidence is so, is so contrary. So there you have a set of levels. And we aspire most, of course, to the persuasive argument or the inclining argument, although we have as a kind of um, ideal of inquiry uh, something like the coercive argument, that is the one that says this is how it is. So kind of moving on to um, religion, um, the area that I spend most of my time discussing, obviously there, uh, there's a varied tradition of religions. Some are more dangerous uh, to individuals and to groups than others. But if they, if they stem from flaws in our thinking, if we have become convinced of a religion for uh, emotional reasons or poor reasoning in general, we spend a lot of time, or at least I do in the, in the United States, actually discussing religion and debating religion. Is that useful? Or how, how much more useful would it be to try to focus on the errors of thinking that might be the underlying problem? Or do religions have such wonderful protective mechanisms that they're almost impervious to that? Well, they, they have these um, powerful protective mechanisms one of which is the sheer uh, um, vagueness of the concepts in play, the, the very concept of God uh, or deity, the, the, the concept of faith, the, uh, the, the use of formulae um, which appear to give comfort or, or security but which are actually very difficult to attach a meaning to. Um, I've often thought that, that contesting religion as a phenomenon in our world is like having a boxing match with a huge, huge piece of jello. Because, you know, if you land a punch in one place, it just sort of goes bloop out another place and then resumes its original shape. And, and people will say to you, oh, well, that's not what I mean by religion. That's not what I mean by God. That's not what I mean by faith. And so it's incredibly hard to pin it down and to nail its feet to the floor. Uh, it, it's also um, uh, generative of this confusion that people have that any kind of traditional worldview like the non-religious philosophies of uh, Theravada Buddhism and Jainism and Confucianism and the humanistic tradition which has its roots right back in classical antiquity and the great atheist traditions of thought in India where hundreds of millions of people in our world live without any kind of God or, or theism but they live very sincere and thoughtful lives I mean look at Jains you know look at Theravada Buddhism so um, the, 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 the fact that it is so diffuse makes it very difficult to get traction there. It's very difficult to, to, to have a, a debate on agreed grounds. So when, when one's tackling the question of religion, the, the, the thing to do is to begin with the particular religion that a person subscribes to. And the first thing to say, of course, is, and the reason, probably, the reason why you subscribe to this particular religion religion is because your parents did or because your community does and that is a very speaking fact uh, I, I was reading Dan Dennett's um, book about the you know the clergy project mm -hmm. about what some of the uh, atheist clergymen were saying about their experience clergymen and women and uh, what comes across so strongly is how powerful their cultural loyalties are in keeping people within the faith or wanting to believe or finding it very, very difficult to disagree and to break out. Um, and one can sympathize with that on an individual level. But what one doesn't sympathize with is this extraordinary brainwashing um, that goes on. No religion would survive if it didn't have access to very small children whose minds it can distort or shape with its religious views. Which a lot of them exploit by Either and I don't want to get into conspiracy theories about intent of, of, of you know oligarchies and churches and stuff, but by taking control of the family uh, and, and what it means to be the family, mm -hmm. when you are removed from the family, when you're no longer a non-believer, that gives them access and in some cases encouraging reproduction in massive numbers with the quiverful mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives them a, a ready-made audience that's, yeah. that's brought up from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a real problem. And I think also that... Um, 
the uh, um, uh, the 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 sort of odium which is attached to certain views, like for example evolution, let us mm. say, uh, or the um, very powerfully rooted idea that you couldn't trust a politician unless they profess the faith, which is an extraordinary paradox when you think about it. You know, you're going to put somebody in charge of the buttons for nuclear warfare who you know believes that a virgin gave birth or something. I mean, if anybody really thought about it, it would be scary to, to do that rather than the other way around. But it's become a structural feature of, of uh, US society, certainly, that um, people have to think that way in order to, to hold public office. And hopefully that'll change, especially because, you know, I know there are believers, uh, the Reverend Barry Lynn, who's president of the Americans United for Church, separation of church and state, uh, we tend to agree on almost everything except whether or not there's a God. Mm -hmm. And I'd far rather, I'd sooner vote for him for president than perhaps some atheists I know who I have far greater disagreement with. But that's that's the exception that, mm -hmm. as you pointed out earlier, would be listed as proving the rule. Um, do you feel that there's a value in having public debates? And, we, and, and I'm talking about not necessarily like a scored debate, but taking what happens in the academic world, as you and I have both done and others have, uh, getting together in front of a large group of people in a structured format. Are, are we doing it wrong? Is there value in it? Is, are there things we should change about how we do that? No, I think there's great value in it, actually, because... Um, the, the, the sort of people who are going to be helped or influenced in some way by the fact of debate will be those people who are havering, the people who are on, on the cusp, on the margin, who are not sure, who feel that they're moving away from a faith, uh, or who just simply want to know that they're not, not alone. I mean, one of the great problems really is that people who feel very isolated <coughs> go to church with their family every Sunday, but uh, they don't really believe and they've got nobody to talk to. But the existence of people out there serious, sincere, well-intentioned people who think and, and uh, discuss sensibly about political matters and social and moral matters, but who don't have a theistic faith, that, that is something which provides the possibility of, of a home and, and possibility of a community that, um, that people can move to. I had a really interesting experience a couple of years ago, um, great gig this, I was giving some lectures on the Queen Mary II on the Atlantic crossing from, from the UK to the US, it was lovely. Uh, four one-hour lectures in a six-day crossing, so it wasn't exactly hard work. But, but I, I gave some lectures on a, a, a book I'd written which was about the two traditions of thought, the theistic and non-theistic traditions of morality. And uh, um, uh, an American lady came up to me and she said, uh, oh, you know, I've been going to church all my life with my family and my husband and I and my children, we do it, it's just what we do in our community. You know, and if ever I've had any sort of skeptical thoughts or anything, I've just sort of pushed them aside. Now, both she and her husband were um, medical practitioners and you know, highly educated, trained, uh, responsible people. And she, um, but, but never really tackled this question of, of her faith. And she said, I've been reading the book that you were lecturing about here on the ship and I've been li listening to you. And really, you know, it makes me think, I, I've never really thought about these things. And on the last day of the crossing, she came up to me and said, uh, do you know, I, I just don't believe and I don't think I ever have really. And she burst into tears. And that was a, a very moving moment because it was a moment of liberation. As somebody suddenly no longer seeing the world a, a certain way. And of course to have a religious view of the world is very constraining. You, you're seeing it through the little gaps in, a, you know, in, a, in an intellectual prison. I mean, not, not open to any possibility. So many of them are closed down by the ordinances of the faith. And it was a very moving moment to see that happen. And I think for every, you know, it's, it's like the, the church doctrine about one soul being saved, you know, you do feel as if uh, that, that that had been an act of salvation of a certain kind. And it's, it's often kind of viewed that way. There are, I've, you know, over the course of 10 years, I've received lots of feedback from the TV show and, and people who have changed their minds and, and feel free. We've now got organizations like Recovering From Religion that are helping. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, early on, I, I would people would say, why, why are you doing this show? And I would jokingly say, oh, it's penance for all the years I spent leading people to Jesus. Now I want to grab them and their friends and bring them back. Uh, but actually, I almost consider it, as a humanist, kind of a, a duty, some sort of obligation um, in the realm of ethics to try to help people see the truth as I understand it. And if I happen to be wrong, by all means, please help me out. Sure. And in the course of doing this, you know, obviously I do debates and I'm supporting debates, which is why we're having uh, the conversation. But I, I like the fact 
that we're starting to recognize that we need to also provide community landing places for people who are leaving religion. And you, as a, a major spokesperson for humanism, particularly in Britain, um, I, I wonder, in a, in a country like yours that is far more secular than mine, is there much need for that as well, or is, is it sufficiently different that we perhaps focus more on you know, the rational thought than we do on the person and the community? Mm -hmm. um, well, this is a very interesting debate, this, because there are people, uh, non-theists, who think that the, since the really important thing about religion for many, many people is the community aspect of it, that, that you, you do feel that you belong to uh, something where there's a shared set of values and commonalities and you meet on a regular basis and sing nice songs and so on, why can't non-believers have something parallel? And uh, this has been tried a couple of times. Back in the 19th century, the, the positivist movement started by Auguste Comte. It tried to have um, sort of non-God no, no church uh, with services and, and everything else and prayers to reason and what have you. And it failed miserably and was roundly mocked at the time. And as a result, it left a lot of scars on the part of people who um, had, that po had that point of view, felt the need for community, but were um, somewhat abashed by the, by the failure of that enterprise. Here in the UK, and there's been a, um, a, a group of people who have on Sundays, on Sunday mornings, met to have a lecture on some aspect of science or history or something as an alternative. So there people would meet together and they would form friendships and relationships, have a sense of community, socialise sometimes, but they're a collective endeavour anyway was focused on the increase of knowledge around science and that still goes on today and I, I think that's that's one good alternative but for me what would be really ideal is if people would recapture for themselves a sense of um, uh, of something which the religions have hijacked now the religions talk about spirituality and spiritual experience if one were able to use that term the spiritual to denote something non-transcendental, non-spooky, non-soul-like, non but just to mean the, the complex set of emotional and intellectual reactions that we have to others and to the world around us, our sort of holistic attitude towards the world, if by that we, we meant the, the, the spiritual, then I think that is the most important part of us and the deepest feature of our lives. And in order to nourish and feed that aspect of us, what we need to do is to reclaim the fact that a walk in the country or dinner with friends or just lying in bed on a holiday morning or uh, having a glass of wine at sunset, these are spiritual exercises. These are things that refresh us, that reconnect us to other people and the world around us. If we could recover the significance of those things and not believe that they've been hijacked away to 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and that's when spirituality happens, then I think we see that some of the things that, that um, uh, non-religious people are anxious to try to preserve from religion um, are already there, they were already to hand. The one thing that remains of course is the sense of our community with other people. But there again, let's recover the fact that when we go to a basketball game or we or we meet with our friends in the pub or something, this is us you know, engaging, connecting with our fellow human beings and because we are essentially social creatures and we need these relationships, they are the ones that we should foster and nourish. Our friendships, our, our family relationships, our participation in and contribution to our communities. I mean, these are all things that are naturally part of us, have nothing to do with religion, they have everything to do with our humanity. And I, I, I find it difficult to believe that there are many people who would object to that. It's, it seems eminently reasonable and wonderful and, and engages who we are. And, and I've said before that I'm fine with the, the use of the word spirit in the, in the poetic sense of the human spirit. Um, but the problem may be the term, that spirituality has become uh, such a word that it could mean almost anything to anybody. It's been abused and it carries this baggage sure, of the sure. transcendent or the divine along with it. Um, I know there's a often, uh, so there's, there's two schools of thought. We either, either reclaim a label and, and use it proudly and, and change its meaning on our own, mm -hmm. or we come up with a new label. And I've seen both of them succeed and fail. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the best answer is, but maybe conveying the concepts that you're conveying mm -hmm. may be enough, no matter what they call it. Yeah. Well, my, my own preferred strategy would be to find a new word. 
but in, in the meanwhile, wh wh while we get people to take up the new word, you know, w words matter actually, uh, uh, because uh, encapsulations of a way of thinking about something are very, very helpful to people, and they can really shift the ground. If you can articulate a, um, a, a view in such a way that people really get the point, and then they can they can live it. So we do need a new word. While we're moving to that new word, or while we're trying to explain its content, I suppose we have to piggyback off the old word, but always hedge with qualifications. Because I'm absolutely with you. If we if we use the old word, then we never really know whether people attach the same meaning to it that we're trying to attach to it, and that, that, and that is a difficulty. It's like um, people who say, oh, well, um, of course God isn't a... Uh, a man with a beard or a cloud um, it's uh, it's the world or it's the ground of being or it's some energy or something like that and of course that's hopeless because there this this word this tiny little word is being so stretched and abused and you know filled up with all sorts of baggage and anybody can do anything with it and yet somehow or other those three letters just by themselves give some kind of imprimatur they make it okay you know this is one of the areas, not to divert too much from, from the discussion debates, I, I have a disagreement with uh, some of my friends who are theological non-cognitivists who would claim that the, the concept of God, just we simply can't process it and so I can have no position on it. And to me that seems absurd because clearly we communicate and I say God and yes, this individual may have a different concept of God than another individual and I'm fine with talking about whatever their concept of God is. And the fact that it's it's incomplete doesn't, or the fact that I'm not able to fully comprehend it doesn't mean that it's in fact incomprehensible and, and something that we can't discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you had thoughts on that particular discussion. Well, um, I mean, it's it's a, a, a kind of stone in the shoe of every discussion um, in the great argument between theism and non-theism that this this concept can do pretty well anything it likes and people could do pretty well anything they like with it and that is exactly the problem with it so this is why sometimes it's very useful in philosophy for example to use paraphrases I, mean, I think to give you a an, an, um, kind of tangential example there are, there are extremely important terms like good or true or beautiful which are much much debated in, in philosophy they're very very contested concepts and their reason for being so is that they are so over capacious and have meant so many different things to different people. So I sometimes say to my students, look, instead of talking about the concept of truth, treat that the word or the phrase is true, it's a pretty good expression, as a dummy, a placeholder for something that you need to put in there which is much more specific. Ask yourself this question, what would you put into the place of the phrase is true if you were talking mathematics or if you were talking morality? or if you were talking about the spatio-temporal physical world. Surely that is true. What it is to be true in those different debates is a different thing, because how would you arrive at it? Now, of course, there are some philosophers who say that the concept of truth must be univocal across all domains of, of discourse, but I, I would have thought that that's a pretty hopeless case, because what is it for 1 plus 1 equals 2 to be true? What is it for there is a camera in front of me now to be true? Surely the way that you verify these things or explain how they are true are very, very different. So the, the, the word true turns out to be in need of being displaced. Now if you try this with the word God, say, I, you know, I, when I make a joke with people who say, um, where did the universe come from? It was created by God. I say, well, don't use the word God. Use the name Fred. See how that works. Eh? So Fred created the universe. And suddenly you see that you are not talking about anything. It doesn't explain anything. You haven't said anything. You know, who's Fred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, suddenly you see the vacuity of it. And this could be the power of removing a, a word which has become an obstacle and trying to articulate things in a different way. I say to my, my children, I say, never use the word God. Always use the phrase gods and goddesses. And in discussion with, with people, I say, why do you believe in gods and goddesses? Or if that's too long, then just use the word Fred and see whether you feel that anything that anybody claims using that word actually makes sense. So are there topics that we probably shouldn't be debating or perhaps we shouldn't debate them anymore? No, I don't think we should... We should uh, Put, put anything off the table. We should just um, have, have better things to say about some of them, I think. In, in the case of, of religion, 
and when we think not about our advanced educated societies where there is some chance anyway that bit by bit the, the, the non-theistic view, the secularist view, the scientific view is gaining traction. I mean, I, I read and it's something that Dan Dennett just uh, recently wrote that a claim has been made to the effect that only 4% of today's American teenagers will um, still be actively religious when they reach their 50s. And that's an extremely hopeful statistic. I mean, it sounds to me wildly over-optimistic, but you know, it would be wonderful if it were true. Um, but in the advanced educated um, uh, economies of the world, the idea that this kind of discussion that you and I are having could have a, a positive influence in the direction of a more secular and open scientific worldview um, makes sense. But if you think about those countries where uh, religion is still the, 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 the thing which takes almost all the oxygen out of the possibility of different sorts of civil society organizations or, or, or uh, any kind of pluralism in that society or any opportunity for debate and disagreement and alternative views to flourish. I think, for example, of Muslim majority countries where it's tremendously hard for a, an individual to go against this enormously powerful current of family and, and society where it is, it is mortally dangerous to be an apostate or to give expression to alternative views. And there, you know, there is still a huge amount of work to be done. Although my own view is that um, the, uh, uh, the forces of history, if we survive this century, are uh, on the side of, uh, of you and me rather than, rather than the other guys. One could hope. When it comes to having, not, not a formal debate, but conversations with friends and co-workers and family members, is there, do you have a recommendation for where an individual might focus their attentions, their studies, to be better at having those conversations? Uh, is, it, is it in the academic or in some area of philosophy, is it more about questioning and looking at the human being and, and being inquisitive? Is there a mix? I think there are two things. Um, th there is always a place for direct challenge over claims, how they're substantiated, and what they really mean. So at, at some point, one is always going to have to get down to the nitty gritty and really have a discussion about those things. But in a way, the, the, the more powerful thing is to show the viability, the richness and the, um, the fruitfulness really of, of the alternative view. This is one reason why I think that talking about humanism with the small age, so the, the sincere ethical endeavor that people might make um, about trying to live responsibly with their fellows and, and being a, a net contributor in society and, and to do it in ways that are very constructive about things like social justice, for example, uh, about, about things like um, uh, treating with respect the uh, intrinsic dignity of other human beings unless they forfeit it, you know, that, that kind of thing. Is, is very important because to live by example, to show that there are really worthwhile, interesting, flourishing lives that are lived on a certain premise is a much more cogent argument in a way than anything we can do verbally. But still, that, that has to be um, uh, allied to the fact that from time to time there has to be a direct challenge. And the challenge isn't always just about you know, what, what, what people claim to believe, what people think that they believe. Right. But it's, it's also about, and, and even in sometimes more, more effectively, about the consequences of those beliefs. Stem cell research, um, human reproduction, reproductive rights of women, uh, things like termination of pregnancies or gay marriage. Or, you know, there are so many different issues in which religious views have been very, very um, you know, reactionary and have balked uh, progress and have been very unkind to people. And, and it's those things, those issues, where uh, by defeating the argument that gives rise to those attitudes, that one shows how much better a place society could be without them. Is there a particular argument from apologists and defenders of the faith uh, that you perhaps find mildly compelling or think is their best or understand why people uh, tend to opt for that line of reasoning? There is one, one con uh, consideration, and, and that is that uh, the psychological support and comfort that religious beliefs give to people who are ill or old or lonely or afraid or frightened 
and my sympathies, my human sympathies with people who are in that kind of predicament are such that I'm, I'm almost tempted, almost, but not, not quite tempted to think that a comforting lie is a kind thing in that circumstance. You know, would I say to somebody who had been diagnosed with cancer, was terrified of the diagnosis, would I just blurt it out? Or wouldn't I try to find some way of, of um, giving them hope or something? And I suppose religion uh, gives uh, a sort of hope to people who find themselves in those predicaments. So people who say, you know, religion is a great comfort to a lot of people, and you can single out the very vulnerable people to whom it's a prop, would you knock that prop away from underneath them? And I find that a, a consideration. And I find it one of the most difficult things to um, subscribe to, but I do subscribe to it. The idea that truth is a much, we use the word truth in this difficult philosophical sense, but um, rational cogency, the rational power of uh, the non-theistic position is such that I think intellectual honesty requires that we go with it even in the face of the fact that we might upset somebody who's in that vulnerable position. That seems a very hard and a cruel thing to say, but the, the next step is to say, surely there are ways that we human beings can provide the comfort and the help and the friendship and the, the succour and the support that those vulnerable people might need. Why leave the little old lady who lives on her own and is ill and afraid uh, up to a set of falsehoods to comfort her? We should be doing it. I completely agree. I've looked at it as a way of how best to address the issue. If my grandmother's on her deathbed and she asks me if she's going to heaven, well, she's not going to ask that because she already knows what my opinion is. Uh, but I'm not going to try to talk her out of her belief at that point. But I think one of the reasons that dealing with death and loss and grief is so problematic is that religions have in many ways poisoned the conversation. Yes. And that if we change the way society looks at death as hey, this is inevitable, you, you might want to take care of yourself, you might want to change the way you interact with people because you're not going to get a chance to make up for it afterwards. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily go for the funeral aspect where we turn someone's funeral into, oh, let's have a joy, so, unless that's what people want to do. But it seems that if you change the way people view death to begin with, these problems where religions provide comfort yeah. might go away. Mm -hmm. It's been said that religions offer you or uh, poison you and then offer the cure. And I, mm. I said that religions instead convince you that you've been poisoned and then offer you the homeopathic remedy because <laughs> the, the entire thing is fictional start to finish. <laughs> you know, that, that's an extremely good characterization of it. Although, of course, it's, it's true that uh, Christianity, for example, is predicated on the idea that we're all born sick and Christianity is the, is the cure or the, uh, the remedy. And that, that's caused problems for them as well. Yeah. Exactly at what age does somebody start being sick? If you were born that way, but you haven't reached the answer reason. Is there a particular argument from apologists that you wish would, uh, for lack of a better phrasing, die in a fire? Just go away. I'm tired of hearing this argument. Yeah. Well, um, the, the, the argument is our ignorance is such, and there are so many gaps in our knowledge, that we, we, we need to appeal to the idea of, of an agency as if that actually did anything for us but but the the um the god of the gaps move very many people find it compelling or they, they find it satisfying and i think there's a psychological reason for it which is that we human beings like a narrative we like a beginning a middle and an end we like an explanation you know we think in terms of causal structure and uh, we want an, we want an account of of uh, what it's all about and a nice, neat, clean one which says, well, Fred created the universe and we're here to do our best and you know, but then he's going to punish us or reward us at the end of it. But that's a nice little you know, uh, two-minute two explanation that you can put in your back pocket and forget about. And I think it's that the, the psychology, uh, the, the psychological need for an encapsulation, because otherwise it's all a mess. What the hell are we doing here? What's going on? And you know, where did it come from? Where's it going? It's vertiginous. It's too difficult for people to cope with. It's like that feeling you get when you look up at the night sky and, and you really have a sense of the immense distances that are involved. That some of those things twinkling up there are galaxies, not stars, and they're a heck of a long way away. And that feeling is you're just going to drown in immensity. Well, the, the drowning in psychological immensity is too much for most people. They can't cope with it, and that's why they need that, that story. And so that, that the, the sort of um, facile invocation of a, 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 a quote-unquote thing that just 
you know, fills up all the gaps and gives you your neat little narrative. That's the main move by religion that I wish would wither and die away. I wish what people would be able to do is to have the, um, the scientific mindset, which is very open-ended, lives with doubt, in fact welcomes it and enjoys it. I love the, the, the attitude of mine which says, we just don't know, and so that's exciting because no one can go and try and find out. I have a friend who's a very senior member of uh, the, la the compact muon solenoid experiment at the Large Hadron Collider in mm -hmm. CERN in Geneva. That's one of the two major experiments that were looking for the Higgs. Mm -hmm. And after the Higgs bo uh, boson was found, he said to me, do you know, I, I got a sneaking wish that we hadn't found it because then it would have been so much more interesting because then there would have been a big mystery that we could really tr try to get our teeth into. I love that attitude. I think it's just wonderful. But it's a scary attitude for most people, I think, because they want that n closed box. Well, thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate your time, as will the people who watch it. And hopefully we'll be able to do something like this again. It's great to see you, Matt, really. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me on. Thanks. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.